Hey, Krista, I was just going to let you know, um, Alice isn't coming. She sent her email, but then I also got an out of office from Ellen Craig. So I'm not sure if anybody's coming from region 10 or not. Oh, I do remember seeing something from Ellen wondering if she should send somebody, but we don't, we don't need a quorum any longer. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. Yes, maybe we're waiting on Katie and Jenny. Katie, do you know if Jenny's coming? Oh, Ashley. We'll give them just a couple more minutes. Okay, we can go ahead and get started. Everyone's ready. I think my screen is free though, so I may stop my video. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Can everybody hear me? I might need to jump off and get on my laptop and use my hotspot. We can hear you. Okay. All right. So, um, everyone have a chance to look at the agenda um, and then our meeting notes from last time. And are we good to approve them?
All right, well, let me go. All right, bye. I think something happened to Krista. All right, sorry everybody, I got kicked off and we're having technical issues. So hopefully this will be better. So <laughs> the agenda and then our meeting notes from last time, everybody have a chance to look at them and any changes, corrections? Good to approve them, I guess. All right, evidence-based practices training follow-up discussion. So I've had some more discussion here with Martha and then also with our technical assistant from Casey Foundation. And I think right now we're going to hold off on our TINS work group that we wanted to create um, just because we have a lot of other balls up in the air right now. So I think if this team wants to talk about doing something with a work group, um, I think maybe go ahead. And I mean, we're happy to be at the table. Um, I just, apparently we're not ready to move forward yet with that work group um, with, with everything going on and us having some staffing issues and things like that. Um, what are people's thoughts? So I think Alice and Region 10 were kind of um, some of the major drivers of this. It might be worth bringing it back up when they're here at the meeting. That's what I was thinking too. I was looking around, I think <laughs> neither of them are here. So we will table that till next month. Um, FAPT updates, Erica, anything for the county? Yeah, can't stop yawning. Um, no, and there's nothing that is jumping to mind. I know that we said, in fact, a couple weeks ago, Erica can take this back to program. And now for the life of me, I cannot recall. And I clearly didn't write it down in a place that is uh, useful right now. So I don't know, if Jennifer or Krista, you guys remember what that might have been or Ashley, um, but I don't, I don't remember. I apologize. No, it's all good. I was going to say, I have um, one thing that was going to come up under the CSA coordinators update, which kind of falls in line with, with one of those items. So yeah. I'll let Katie, if she wants to do the city fact before I get into that. Thank you. Yeah, and I cannot remember myself. I don't know that we have anything significant from city fact here. Okay, thank you both. Um, CSA coordinators. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm actually going to cover just really quickly because it's um, I, I think it should be pretty fast. The CSA conference is coming up in October um, and one of the folks from OCS had asked us to get input about whether or not um, CPMT members and since program is a subcommittee of CPMT you all would be included in this um, to see if you would be interested in participating in a pre-conference workshop that's tailored specifically for your needs at the annual CSA conference. So typically during the conference, there's like a pre-conference that happens for CSA coordinators. And I guess they're asking if you all would be interested in having this kind of pre-conference that's specific for CPMT. We don't, don't have information what the topic would be, yeah. <laughs> or if there would be cost or when it or anything like that. Um, 
Well, it's I think really if they just could engagement. provide that part, then I think we could then gauge interest. Like if they could tell us, and these are some ideas of what they would cover, topics that they would cover during this time. Like that I don't makes... know how they're supposed to like gauge interest when we don't know what they talk about. Are they yeah. talk so about how to questions... be a CPMT member? I'm not sure. So part of it, I will say, is other coordinators have already sent back and said, like, you need to tell us what the like more details about this before we can really gauge interest so that has gone back to them um but as of this morning like they're saying hey we've got your questions but we're just waiting for them to respond back so once they do that then we'll probably like check back in with you guys to see if you would be interested and just um, say ditto then yep um so the other thing that i was going to talk about and I, I think this came up at fapt i'm hoping i'm remembering correctly too um and it and we actually talked about it at CPMT as well. There, um, there's this sort of need that seems to be happening in the community about serving our kids. So it originally started with um, a, a county foster care case where we basically had a child without placement um, and they had to be housed at DSS, which was really not an appropriate situation, but we also had nothing. And so we, um, we were really in a tough place. So, and it actually came up again as a potential need that happened with a different case, um, but thankfully that one worked out. And so part of the conversation was about what to do in these situations where we now have residential placements who are becoming really particular about the kind of kids they wanna take, even though you know that was the whole point of their facility is to be able to take more challenging kids. Um, and then we're also competing with this whole notion that some of them are not taking Medicaid anymore. So it becomes a, um, a financial issue if we're going to pay for the entire cost of that placement. Um, and so, you know, Alice had a good point about saying that it's really not just a foster care issue. Um, it has to do with, you know, they prevention has faced times where they needed some sort of respite. And if kids don't have like kinship or other family as a potential resource that they've really struggled to find a respite home for these kids. Um, and so part of that was to really kind of bring the program to say, is there capacity to try to develop something in our community, knowing that there seems to be more of this happening um, and recognizing that it is a need in our community. And we're really struggling to meet that need. Um, and again, like the, the cases have become more complicated. I feel like the pandemic has played a factor in that. Um, some of the behaviors are challenging and it just seems like providers are becoming a lot more particular about who they want to accept. Um, and so we just wanted to bring that here to talk to folks about. Um, you know, one of the things I remember from years ago and some of you others might remember too, we had like assessment homes back in the day, like community attention had those, although they may have been TAF. I can't even remember if it was TAF or CAF at that point, um, but they were really homes that were short-term, but they were accessible to the kids in our community. Um, and then someone had mentioned the runaway shelter uh, that they, they were thinking that that was actually funded by HUD. Um, and so again, just kind of bringing that to you all to, to hear your thoughts about it and to see what can we do as a community about this need. Well, I think, I think CAF does a good job about essentially providing assessment homes um, when they can. You know, I don't think that, you know, if they do a good job of like, you know, providing one night, sometimes two nights, you know, they've, they've definitely done that throughout um, time. Um, so I don't know if like actually having assessment homes, uh, again, is really the answer, maybe, you know, upping, you know, recruitment or something like that. But I, I think that um, they've really trained their foster parents to understand that you could have a placement for a long term, you could have it for a short amount of time, think things of that nature. Um, and they, there's definitely families that are willing to pitch in when possible, but it does seem like we need more of them. Um, 
and then I'm not too sure, like, you know, what happened in your case, but I mean, it's our experience that like, if there's a family that's willing, then CAF puts them forward for sure. Um, so, and I think the other thing that's complicated about the residentials um, is not only those two things that you mentioned, Jennifer, but also there's no way to get a kid in like in some type of quick way. Um, it takes days um, to get kids in a placement. So like, if you do have a situation that you need a place for a child to sleep, like it's not gonna happen at a residential. Like there, it's absolutely not gonna happen. Like you can't get a kid in in like four hours. Um, so I feel like even though some of them, those residentials have the ability to take some of these kids, like we can't make it happen um, because of the things that they've put in place quickly. So I don't know if that's another thing to maybe um, an area to focus on is the timing of it versus, um, I don't know, I don't know if you're thinking about creating something new or what you guys were maybe thinking about or, or open to all ideas. I'd be curious about which pieces of that um, we actually have control over from a community perspective. And so, you know, that's where we can focus, like you're saying, Jenny, on our efforts to uh, maybe revisit that and improve those processes. I know from our side, at least in these couple cases that have come up most recently, it's it's not been as much, it's been all the stuff that's out of our control. Um, you know, COVID, of course, um, crazy, crazy winter weather doesn't help. Um, but I mean, we had, uh, we almost had two different kids that we were trying to house at our office with staff at the same time during these crazy storms uh, with significant behavioral and medical needs. So, um, I, I don't know what the answer is, Jennifer. I know that we've we've talked on our end, and um, I think some of it is probably some recruitment needs to have more resources, more homes available, and then also ensuring that we have adequate community supports um, to help them deal with the behaviors that they're seeing. Uh, so that you know, taking a foster kid and you're taking in. There's the potential to be taking in quite a bit of uh, behavior challenges and needs, and so just ensuring that they have access to that timely. And I think it, se it sounds like we're doing better. We don't have as many wait lists, or they're not as long uh, for providers and things. But I don't know if that's an area that maybe we can focus on too. That's more that's closer to being in our control, where we can beef some of that up. So almost like some type of crisis team that could be deployed if you know a family takes on a challenging kid, then they would know that they would have this type of, you know, support, um, therapeutic support for that child, and maybe they would be more willing. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, yes, I think you articulated it better. Um, it makes me think of what we we had here in Culpeper for a while, many years ago. I mean, it was kind of it was a we call it like I think we called it virtual residential. I mean, it was essentially being able to provide, uh, you know, 24 hours care for a short period of time, which I know, I know through Medicaid, you know, you can do X, Y, and Z, and the providers have that. So I don't know if that's part of what would be beneficial to at least salvage a placement if we could find a place for the kiddo to sleep besides the building um, or a hotel room and, and just coming up with the funding for all of that. Uh, but that's a good idea. I, hadn't, I don't think that we've tossed that one around yet. So in Culpepper, did you have like an agency that provided that service or? Okay. And so nobody from Reed and Ten is on the call, but I think, you know, they, they have had, and again, I think there's always like, we always have staffing conundrums going on, but they have the um, crisis response something, you know, um, I don't know what it's exactly called, um, but they serve for about two weeks. And I, I don't know the exact circumstances of the kids that you're talking about, but I think for me, it's the balance of if you think a kiddo requires residential and there are barriers to get them there, whether it's the weather or COVID, like, 
I think to Erica's point, we don't have control over what residentials have put in place or the weather, but if there has to be a stop gap between how we serve those kids and, and getting them to the right level of care, I think our community could work to get those things in place. And if we need to revisit that stabilization um, support so we can keep the kids safe and families safe while, while we're serving, um, I think that's a conversation that Region 10 has always been willing to have. And how do we bump, right, right? How do we get that service in place immediately versus, you know, there, there can be an intake in two weeks or there's four kids waiting, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but I think sometimes we also then like try and stretch that out like, oh, well, it's going well today. But if also like if the kid requires residential, then they still need to go to that placement because at some point it's not going well and then it still will take that extra three weeks to get them to the residential that they still needed two weeks ago. I just right. like it's important to remember that because I um, I've certainly been guilty of like, but it's going better. So we should just keep it. Um, and then the wheels come off at some point. So um, I know we want to keep kids in the community as much as we possibly can. And we work hard to do that. But I also think we've been down this path before where we have tried to uh, program has tried to look at and create service to keep kids as many kids as we can. Um, and we did a good job, but I think there's also the reality of there are some kids who require that residential for a period of time. I don't, Jennifer, can you talk a little bit or can somebody talk about other than, is it co mostly COVID related that residentials have put in place that is making it more difficult or are there other things going on that we're struggling to get kids where they need to be right now? I think there's a there's a couple different things. So the, the, the one real recent one that was, during the storms was she came home for a temporary visit through Christmas. So it was a five or six day. And it was, it was kind of a trial too with a potential placement option. Um, it disrupted pretty quickly. And so naturally the response was, all right, let's get her back to placement. Well, the placement had a COVID outbreak, so she couldn't come. And then, and then there were all these other issues with that placement, which I don't know, Jennifer can go into here. Um, so that's one issue. Like she definitely is a kiddo who needed residential. That's where she had been, tried to step down and it wasn't, it wasn't the right time. So we had to get that situated, but we were also running into situations where the kiddo needs to be in the community and doesn't require residential. However, we don't, we can't find a home um, and we can't find, you know, for whatever reasons, multiple placements. I've got a kiddo that we're working with who's had five placement disruptions in what, two and a half months. Um, and some of that is stuff like she's calling a foster parent a B, she's cussing at her, she's being defiant, oppositional. So those kinds of things are the behaviors that we can address in the community, given the opportunity to have the right supports in place. And so, you know, hindsight, I think that we could do that, you know, we can, we can tease that out. So I feel like it's kind of both, like there's the, what do you do with the kids that need residential today, but can't get there for three weeks? And then what about these kids who don't need residential, but that's all we have left. And then we still can't get them in. So where do they go? Because no, everybody is saying, we're giving notice, we're giving notice. Um, so there's a lot of, um, I like that the crisis stay support services and the mobile crisis services, those are all really helpful, but they, I mean, it's almost like we need a, like a hotel that, where we, where we can have these kids so they can sleep and they can eat and we can do all of this, the other things that they need and meet their needs uh, besides fast food in Albemarle County DSS. And I don't know how much the city has run into that. I know throughout the state, this isn't an unusual experience. I think we're seeing more of that across the state. Um, so uh, it's just a big challenge period. The other COVID problem is that the residentials require a negative COVID test. And so we all know how hard this get tests. Um, I'm sure that will get better, but um, so that was just like one more thing that um, you can't get a, a kid into placement quickly. It was just one more thing on the list.
Okay, so maybe we want to kind of talk about that a little more next month too, when when Region 10 is back at the table. Um, I think we can add that to our agenda. Are there Who's any supposed to be coming from CAF? Sorry, I forgot. I don't know if we have anyone particularly from CAF. Um, Kamisha, my understanding is that you are representing community attention as a whole, or am I mistaken? Okay. Oh, that's right. That makes sense. So I don't know if that would be a thing. Maybe we want to invite CAF to program or for part of it. That could be a possibility so that we could talk about that a little bit more. And I was just going to ask too, are there any data points that would be helpful for me to take back to our team to say, give me these numbers so I can take it back? I know it feels like it's a huge major crisis issue when we're in the middle of a crisis, but if this is one out of every 400 kids we serve, then maybe it's not as big of a deal as it feels in the moment. But if there's data points that I can take back to Alice and to our uh, foster care team and whatnot, that would be helpful. Just, give, just let me know. Erica, that that maybe maybe asking. I'm not saying what you know in the moment that anybody anytime you're thinking about having to have staff sleep in the agency, that doesn't feel good, and it's not good for the kid. Um, but I I will say when I'm thinking about like crisis stabe and mobile crisis, I know on the schools end, and I don't know how Elmar County schools are experiencing it, but like the number of kids that we are. Um, encouraging, asking, um, helping go to the ER for screening for um, suicidal ideation and concerns are skyrocketing. And I know we have kids sitting in the ER for hours, days. There are no beds um, for hospitalization out, you know, like so I also know we are probably on some level going to be taxing mobile um, crisis and and crisis stave on our, you know, on that end too. And so I like I'm I'm also in my head thinking about like not all of the school's kids are CSA kids. And and so it's that balance of that service is going to get stretched beyond and so I would be interested in the number of kids that are experiencing that on the DSS side, because I can't, I can't even count the number of kids on our end, um, like this week alone that I know we were saying, like having conversations with parents. Um, so. So you're interested on to know the number of either kids in foster care or kids being served by in-home um, prevention that are experiencing like some type of mental health crisis where they need to go to the hospital or have an assessment or something like that. Is that what you're asking, Jody? Yeah, I think just knowing, right, that, yeah, I think it would be helpful to have a concrete number. I can certainly look through our data to see how many assessments we are doing. They won't be, I, they won't be CSA kids. I mean, I can try to tease mm -hmm. out who might be a CSA kid versus not. Um, but I just, I think that would be helpful to know, um, what that looks like as we, tr as we have a conversation with region 10, um, they would be able to say how many kids they're serving, but. Kamisha, do you think someone from CAF would be willing to attend our meeting next month to discuss potential possibilities or maybe they have different ideas. Um, I can check in with Charles or Lindsay to see if one of them can come. I do know that like the recruitment of foster families in, in homes have been very low, um, but I can ask one of them to come or send someone. Okay, yeah, just let me know. I think that that might be helpful to have one of them here. Is that it from CSA coordinators or is there anything else? 
Any other comments on this topic? I think that's everything. Does that sound right? Oh, yeah, cool. things we're gonna talk about later in the agenda, so. Okay. I think I remembered what we had said we might wanted to wanted to bring back here, and I think it had to do with case conferencing. Is that correct? It kind that went to it over? went to CPMT, okay. but um, and so they're going to be probably okay. looking to do something about that um, as as the plan. Yeah, we discussed it with CPMT last month, um, and they had some ideas about. Um, what to do about that rate. So I think we're gonna have more of a discussion about it this month. But I don't think there's anything else that per needs to do. Okay, and thanks Jennifer and Katie for covering for me at CPMT. COVID got me finally, so. <laughs> You're um, okay, partner agency updates. Anything going on? Um, I guess we can um, do that along with service provision during COVID. I can say we're still struggling for staff, keeping staff and hiring staff. Um, and so Seth is back out on paternity leave for the month. Kiana is out, our intake officer, on maternity leave until March 1st. They'll both be back March 1st. So it's Aaron Ball and myself running the whole office. We do have our senior intake officer here on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and then I believe we. I mean, we're having the same issues in our branch offices as well. Um, so if we, if we don't get back to you in a timely manner on something, feel free to resend or call. <laughs> Any other updates from anybody? I might have um, just brought this up briefly at the last meeting, but KF is going to go in person with a small cohort of kids that have already done the virtual academy, and it, in hopes that in our summer will be full in person. So we're in the process of recruiting sites, and so the summer will be open to everyone. Um, but our small cohort will be for the spring, kind of like a dry run for us. Um, in-person small group and we're also teams give is going um, small person in group in the next two weeks thanks Misha you are guided um, I know we discussed the capacity last time I believe that each city and county would select three cases for a total of six and then move forward. Um, we had the policy change and then um, Kitty, were you and Jennifer working on a form to authorize funding? Yeah, so, yeah so we drafted the form and we um, are actually checking in with Ellen about um, the six cases and so once Ellen kind of gives us the go ahead, um, we just need to get the CPMT chairs to sign off on the authorization form for those six cases and then Regent can, can start um, doing the UR. Okay, thanks. Um, for our focus areas, the provider surveys we, we talked about last time, we're, we're not sure how um, our families are perceiving them and we think they may be rating 
um, their caseworker perhaps versus the provider. We had talked about some ways to potentially um, clarify the instructions um, as well as kind of seeing what our case managers are telling families and if they're following up with the families. Um, any additional thoughts on that? I actually have a call after this meeting with Tamara who does the, um, who manages the survey monkey. Um, and I know we had a question about the, how we can format um, the questions to make it more clear that they're rating the actual service provider and not their case manager or social worker. Um, so I was gonna have a general conversation with her about that and ask her kind of what our limitations are. But if you guys have any specific questions about how we can format the survey, um, I'm happy to, to ask her. And then I, I it, you know, I think maybe coming up with a plan of, of how we check in with case managers um, to remind them um, of, the, of the survey requirement um, is good. Okay, thanks, Katie. So I don't know if that's just it, all of us going back to our agencies and checking in. Um, again, I don't think this is on people's priority list right now. Um, so, but if there's something that we can do to make the process easier for folks or that will um, give us more results, we're certainly open to that. And Erica, I think I had noticed, in fact, you had kind of explained it a little bit as well uh, when you explained, maybe not. I feel like you did, <laughs> that they would be getting two surveys, but I could be misremembering. I can't remember. I try to, I try to only tell them when I remember. Um, <laughs> expect to, the one about uh, engagement to expect that to come in the mail. Like I try to just be clear to them that that's the one you get in the mail is about us. How are we engaging you in this conversation and meeting your needs in this process? Um, and then I, but I don't really have a sense of what spiel the workers are using when they're talking to folks about um, about the the other survey. So maybe maybe that's part of what we can figure out too is maybe we just need to provide case managers a script because really my script that I use is what I took from you. <laughs> so. I feel like the way the way that we do it, there's a scripted email that gets forwarded to the worker, I feel like. Um, but if they're sending it by text, instead of just forwarding that email, um, you know, some of that might get lost in translation. And I would think that we're doing these more by text than email, but I could be wrong. And I, I haven't checked in or followed up with my staff um, to see what they're doing either. I don't think we've had, I don't think we've had a lot of cases. Um, at the moment, I don't have anyone to check in with about it till March 1st. <laughs> but I, I, I'm gonna make myself a note to follow up. I'll do the same. I think that Alice and I keep putting it on our list to talk to each other about how to bring back the child welfare soups to figure out the best way to get out to our teams. And I think that's where our disconnect has been is that Alice and I haven't remembered from this meeting to our supervision <laughs> on a Tuesday morning. I think we just haven't remembered. So I just wrote it down in two places. So I will, um, I'll remember this then. Okay, anything on data review or service gaps and recommendations. I know we just talked a little bit about data points um, and a gap that we have and that we need. Anything else? 
And then family engagement, um, Katie and Jennifer, I know you sent out the results for that survey, which, I mean, they're good comments and <laughs> it's good feedback from the ones who are sending them in. Any additional comments on those? All right, trauma-informed services updates. Um, Ellen did send out the training sessions or list of training sessions for ACEs. Um, and I talked about how we are transitioning to the Cs, um, which we haven't been trained on yet and we haven't really seen yet, but it was put into policy, um, signed into policy on our director's last day in the office before she was replaced. Um, what does everybody else have? I have not found any of the information about the trauma-informed care network that I th thought I was still receiving for their Monday meetings. Um, so I'm still trying to track that down so I can get that back to the group. I think it's being sent out by the Mental Health Coalition. I'm not saying that right. The What are you saying, Jody? The Mental Wellness Coalition. Yeah. Because it's now underneath. It, it's not yet. Oh, it's not being sent out by them yet? I thought that's, I got it recently. I got it too. Um, Who was it sent I, by? Um, those are good questions, Jenny. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I can look it up, Erica. I was but just going to say, I'm going to search, I'm going to search my inbox, which is a little scary. Um, the decision hasn't been made to go under the uh, mental. I thought it was made. It wasn't, it wasn't made. There's a follow-up meeting um, that hasn't yet been scheduled. I think Alicia sent out the last um, flyer for, there oh, was yeah, a meeting on the 24th. Yeah, I see it. Um, Erica, the next flyer I get, I'll forward to you. How about that? I'll put it on a sticky note on my desk. We all have lots of lists going on. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, I'm reaching, Mary Stebbins used to attend. She's the one who introduced me to that group back when I started. So um, I'm going to ask her if she's still uh, part, participating in that, if she has any information. So I might get an answer here in the next, before the end of the meeting, hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. I'd like to have that too. I'd like to send somebody. I hate that it's during our fab time on Mondays. Anything else on trauma-informed services? Any other business or new business? All right, anything that we need to message out um, for CPMT? I don't really think I took a note of anything. Okay. Anything else at all? Are we good to adjourn? Okay, everybody's so quiet. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you.